Thank you very much. Uh, I'd first like to start uh, by saying my name is Chuck Romine. I'm the director of the Information Technology Laboratory at the National Institute of Standards and Technology, or NIST. And I'm thrilled to be here uh, today to lead this panel, uh, moderate this panel on privacy and IoT. Uh, this is an important topic area for us to, to cover. I also want to say the, uh, the previous moderators have set a pretty high bar, so I'm a little bit uh, concerned about that, but we'll, we'll see how it goes. Um, I want to start by uh, talking a little bit, I want to make one statement about ITL's uh, purpose, so the Information Technology Laboratory at NIST. Uh, the purpose of my laboratory is to cultivate trust in information technology and metrology. And there is no way to cultivate trust in information technology without addressing uh, the privacy issue uh, in the room. And we have a privacy engineering program uh, in ITL that is intended to build, uh, to help the, uh, provide the tools that can build privacy considerations into systems before they're deployed. Um, so I just wanted to get that out of the way. We, we have an entire uh, set of panels that is dedicated to celebrating the capabilities that have been developed over the last 30 years in the NIDRD program. And I've been privileged to be a part of the NIDRD program for about 20 of those 30 years. Um, and, but we also, uh, the NIDRD uh, uh, agencies invest in understanding and providing tools to mitigate the risks associated with those new capabilities as well. And so you've heard some of that uh, conversation going on. There's a thread throughout all of, these, uh, all of these panels that talks about both the benefits and the extraordinary capabilities that have been delivered through these investments, and then the associated risks. Um, now, I will introduce the panel in just a moment with very brief introductions before we get into the uh, topic. But I want to mention uh, something else, which is perhaps the most important investment uh, that we make from NIST uh, in the NIDRD program is uh, Cami Roberts. Uh, Cami is the director of the National Coordination Office for the NIDRD program, and she and the extraordinary staff that she's privileged to lead uh, are doing just an outstanding job of helping the agencies navigate through this. And so I want to take the opportunity to lead a round of applause for Cami and the whole <laughs> National Coordination Office. So uh, Cami is, as I mentioned, a, an ITL employee uh, and has been on detail as the NCO director for a very long time. I want to tell you a very quick story before we get started. Uh, I had the privilege of uh, being the acting director of the National Coordination Office for about 10 months uh, a number of years ago. So I can tell you it's an incredibly difficult job that balances technical acumen with uh, extraordinary need for uh, personal, interpersonal skills. And that's why Cami uh, excels at that. I had, I had one opportunity to call uh, a congressional staffer when I was the acting director. Uh, it was a cold call, and I said, uh, yeah, my name is Chuck Romine. I'm the acting director of the National Coordination Office for the Networking and Information Technology Research and Development Program. And there was this long pause, and he said, you must be very proud. <laughs> <laughs> OK. So uh, on to the introductions. Uh, let me start. Uh, we're, we're going to go in, uh, in a speaking order here where I'm going to uh, give a, a question to each of our panelists uh, for the principal answer and then some commentary from the others. I want to start with, uh, with Mark Groman. Um, I don't know that he's going to really appreciate this, but I describe Mark as uh, one of the early privacy warriors. Uh, this is someone who has cared deeply about privacy for a very long time. Uh, he was appointed senior advisor for privacy in the Obama White House. Uh, and served as the chair of the Federal Privacy Council. Uh, prior to that, he was the chief privacy officer at the uh, FTC. Um, to my immediate left, so Mark is on my far left. To my immediate left is Ed Felton, uh, the Robert E. Kahn Professor of Computer Science and Public Affairs at Princeton University. 
Uh, he's the past director of Princeton's Center for Information Technology Policy and also served as the deputy U.S. chief technology officer. Uh, next to Ed is Kat Magus, who is the program manager for NIST's Cybersecurity for IoT program. Uh, she formerly worked in uh, identity management space, in biometrics, in smart card technologies, and in uh, the development of single sign-on tools. And so she's had a very uh, uh, large footprint in the IT space. And uh, finally, next to her is Sunu Park, uh, who is a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell's Digital Life Initiative. Uh, she's a rising star in the intersection of computer science and law and policy. Mm -hmm. She has a JD from Harvard Law and, and a PhD in computer science from MIT, oh which uh, <laughs> gives me an entire new meaning of exhausted, I think. I, I, just, I can't imagine <laughs> pursuing that, but uh, kudos to her. Uh, okay, so with the introductions out of the way, um, we toyed with the idea of my coming out here and saying, so this privacy thing is all overblown, right? There's nothing really here. But I, I couldn't bring myself to do that. Uh, the, the goal was to do something provocative, right? Uh, but I couldn't bring myself to do that because of the privacy engineering uh, effort at NIST. I think they would have had my head when I got back to NIST, so, uh, so I can't do that. Instead, I'd like to start uh, with Mark um, and ask you, the following, and there are several questions. It's sort of a portmanteau here. I think the, the key thing that we need to understand is what, what do you think privacy risk actually is? We're talking about privacy risk, particularly in the context of IoT. What is it? Um, does everybody understand it the same way? Um, is privacy distilled down to just protecting uh, personally identifiable information, or PII? Is it different for IoT than in other things? And if not, how do we talk about privacy in the context of the Internet of Things so that consumers can understand the risk? So can you set the stage for us a little bit? Okay, great. Well, thank you. It's um, a pleasure to be here with my esteemed colleagues and at a great event to celebrate 30 years. And so I'm thrilled we're talking about privacy. What I want to do first is distinguish privacy from what we've been talking about most of the day or much of the day, which is security and cybersecurity, because the interests and the risks are different. I will also say, and I've been known for saying that, despite the fact that over my 20-year career, the word privacy has been in every title I've had, including at the White House, I hate the word, because <laughs> I do not think the word privacy captures what we're talking about any longer. Uh, the Europeans use data protection, which is more broad, but when I think about this subject, I am thinking about adverse consequences of processing data to individuals, rather than trying to bucket it into a word privacy, which can have 10 different meanings to 10 different people. But we'll stick with it for now because it's the word we've got and it's in the title of your panel. So <laughs> here's how we're gonna, I wanna separate it out, is that when we think about security of your network or of your device, we're talking about confidentiality, integrity, availability of data. That is what we're talking about with information security. And it's generally clear and easy to understand the concepts, and we can build around that. Privacy is completely different. We'll talk about the overlap. But it is not simply confidentiality, integrity, availability. What we're talking about now is how are you using the data? Why was it collected? What are you collecting? What is the purpose? Who will you share it with and why? How will it be transferred? What inferences will be made and why? and how can we limit or restrict that so that we can limit adverse consequences down the road. So you can have data that is secure, meaning you are protecting it from unauthorized access, and you can have authorized processing of data that produces privacy harms. It can be completely secure, but we can have serious adverse consequences from privacy harm. So that's how I distinguish it at a higher level. With respect to Internet of Things, so we can break it down a little bit more when we're talking about connected devices. On the security side, we have, right, secure your device. Make sure no one can hack it so that they can't shut down the power plant or open the dam or change the temperature in your home, right? Keep, it, keep the device secure. But many devices in the IoT, Internet of Things, are collecting or creating or disseminating data. And so that data must be secure. That's the security of the data. We have the security of your device. 
Within the data is, in many cases, a subset of data, which is data about or relating to people. That's the privacy side of Internet of Things. When you have a device in my home, you have sensors in my home, what is it collecting about me or about my home that then produces inferences of information about me? And what do we do with it? So we can assume that data, let's hope, it's secure. But the IoT has all these issues presented about data about people, including do people know that my TV is collecting data about me? Is there an interface where I can interact with this device and learn what it's collecting or change it? Do I understand what's being collected and that what, what inferences are being made by the device or the company from the data that's being collected? So that's sort of a lot, but when I want to, that separates out security from sort of the privacy interests and it also boils it down to some of my concerns with the IoT. Terrific. Anybody else want to sort of weigh in? Does that summarize it pretty well? Or Kat? Yeah, uh, I, I do think you summarized everything. Um, we try and focus on what, what makes IoT different mm -hmm. because there are obviously mm -hmm. privacy concerns across the, the technology ecosystem, but why is IoT different? And um, I think one of the things we identified is obviously scale. The scale of devices is just phenomenal. So what were previously seen as harms are just exponentially growing now. Um, and then I think it's the what, where, and the how about IoT devices that makes it different, right? It's, it's what kind of data is it collecting about us? And, and I think previously, the type of data that was being collected about individuals was related to types of data that we were inputting. But now when you're looking at IoT devices, they're implanted on you. They could be data about your health. They could be data about your energy consumption in your home. They could be data about um, how off tune you might sing in the shower when you think <laughs> nobody's listening to you. Um, so it's the, now you're starting to aggregate data about the individual and things uh, that are physical attributes about the individual that aren't necessarily um, something we've looked at before. Then it's the how that the information is being collected as well. IoT devices are so pervasive in our life right now. They're in physical spaces. Um, you're not even aware many times that those IoT devices are around you. When you look at the scenario of smart cities, you're looking at sensors that have been deployed in public places that are collecting information about you. So that's, that's also slightly different, I think, between kind of the traditional IT world and kind of now that we're starting to, to look at IoT devices. Um, so I talked about the how, I talked about the where, um, and of course the, the, the last thing I wanted to talk about the devices as well is um, that it's, it's, um, it's just so scalable and just being everywhere. Um, you really don't have any idea how that data can get aggregated in the future. Um, so while a manufacturer of a device may look at it and say, well, this is great, you know, I've just got this, this sensor, this sensor is collecting a piece of very innocuous data. Um, as the IoT ecosystem grows and as those devices are discoverable and begin to get integrated into new systems and used in new ways, um, what was previously seen as innocuous data, uh, as it becomes combined with other pieces of data, may actually introduce larger privacy harms and um, I think I'm going to talk about that a little bit when I start talking about cybersecurity, um, but it's really about the context of the use that may impact uh, the risk more than the actual device itself. Terrific. Ed or Sunu, either? Sure. Um, I think these questions about what happens when we have these devices all around us, mm. the devices that we ourselves introduce into our own lives, but also the devices that are built into the environment, and that are carried and installed by the people who are around us and control the spaces that we move in. Um, it's not always obvious, just by inspection, what the implications are of this. And this is an area where research over the last 30 years has really, I think, helped to shed light on what's happening. Research to help understand what information could be collected and by whom. Research to understand what information is being collected and by whom. And then, of course, downstream from that, more research to, uh, to try to understand the implications of all of this and what we might do about it. Terrific. 
And of course, there's no, the good news is that there's no possibility that once the information is collected that it'll be sold to anyone else. We don't, right. we don't have to worry about that. <laughs> yep. So yeah, that's great. Um, right, so um, let me move on to, you know, Mark teed up this idea that obviously cybersecurity and privacy are very, very different things and, and privacy harms can accrue without any cybersecurity event actually having taken place, which is an important hmm. point to, to understand that not every privacy event is traceable back to some breakdown in security. Mm -hmm. In fact, it's, uh, it's much uh, deeper and more insidious than that, perhaps. So the, the question is uh, that, that, that I want to ask Kat, uh, because she's been working in cybersecurity of IoT for years now yeah. and has been paying attention more recently to the privacy implications. Um, one of the big challenges, and I alluded to it a little bit in my snarky comment, I guess, is how do we make progress in improving privacy protections when capitalizing on the information? Once the information has been gathered, once there is a, a, a collection of information, it turns out to be incredibly valuable and monetizable mm. in many ways. How do, we, how do we overcome, this is not a cybersecurity issue per se, but how do, we, how do we make progress when the amount of money that could be made mm with a lot of this information is so vast. Yeah. It's a, that's a tough one. I'm, that is a tough one I'm that I, I, I Throwing I you have, a curveball here. I work for Chuck, <laughs> so I have to be careful. Um, I don't have the answer to that one exactly, um, Chuck. I, 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 I do wanna say, um, you know, coming from the cybersecurity space, I, I do tend to always focus on the doom and gloom and think about all the things that can go wrong. And um, you know, when 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 Chuck and uh, Jim and and you know others in the ITL division asked me to um, you know step up and take on IoT cybersecurity, they reminded me that the reason we're undertaking this effort is because we want to be able to actually see IoT uh, recognized, and we want to be able to see IoT's uh, benefits get actually reaped by society. So I do want to kind of keep keep the focus on the fact that um, you know, the whole reason for doing this is to ensure that there is trust in IoT. Um, and so there are other reasons for wanting to see data shared. And I know, uh, you know a lot of people focus on the monetization of IoT, but uh, we have another project that we're looking at, which is uh, looking broadly at what are potential barriers to IoT adoption. And we had a very interesting meeting yesterday with a group that has been looking at this, uh, at this area for a while. And they highlighted three areas that they saw were going to impact uh, the US's ability to actually adopt IoT technologies. The number one, uh, the first one they mentioned was skills. Um, so it's very interesting today. I think there's been a lot of threads across all of the discussions today on skills um, and how we have to ensure that there's a skill set out there, especially around cybersecurity. Because if you think about it, uh, now that we've started building IT components into these devices that previously weren't smart, um, we're talking about vacuum cleaners. Again, we're talking about scale. The demand for the cybersecurity workforce now uh, is just phenomenal and it's growing exponentially. So uh, really important, I think, that we make sure that we look at um, how we can ensure that we have a sufficient like uh, workforce to, to fill the need there. The second thing they brought up um, was trust. So you teed that up perfectly. Um, they said trust is probably uh, one of the, uh, the top three reasons that they see that IoT could potentially not be adopted and its full potential not be recognized. And yes, trust uh, is anchored in cybersecurity and privacy, but there are also other aspects that I think we have to think about balancing when we think about IoT and we think about trust in IoT. It's around safety. It's around resilience. Um, it is not just about cybersecurity. And as a cybersecurity professional, I have to keep that always in mind. Um, just yesterday, I was speaking to uh, one of my colleagues at, uh, in ITL. And he's focused on looking at implantable devices and looking at how we can harness uh, movement and uh, wearables in individuals to actually generate energy and be able to um, recharge those implantables to actually minimize the medical intervention that's required to actually change the uh, change the, the batteries on these implantable devices. And he pointed out that the minute they built in encryption 
into that, uh, into that over the air kind of processing of, the, of power and transmitting that power to the implantable, it actually became uh, negative, that the consumption of energy was actually higher than the energy that they were able to produce. So um, again, you have to balance and you have to look across the entire kind of trust ecosystem um, and privacy is obviously one of them. And then the third barrier that they brought up was data and the availability of data. And um, it's funny because coming on the heels of AI, we talked a lot about uh, artificial intelligence. And when I think about art artificial intelligence, I think about the need for data, uh, training data uh, that AI needs, but also you're looking at uh, the fact that AI is actually going to exponentially make use of a lot of the data that's out there, and there are very positive things that can be reaped from this uh, access to data. Um, but they also said the importance of sharing the data across IoT, because when you look at a smart city scenario, and when you look at the sensor data and the possibility to collect sensor data um, from perhaps uh, you know, sensor data related to pollution, and the ability to potentially cross-tabulate some of that with perhaps medical information, you could perhaps identify patterns across these different data sets and learn things that could actually have um, high impact potential for individuals and, and great benefits for society. So they highlighted the need to be able to share data. And then the third reason they identified for why we need to be able to share data across organizations was um, not so much pointing to the business reason, but they said um, a lot of small innovative companies were actually identifying as a, a barrier to actually a market entry the ability to test their devices because they simply didn't have the data sets available to them to actually um, to, to test those devices. So again, they talked a lot about this need to have access to the data that a lot of some of the larger manufacturers of IoT devices had. Um, and they, they needed the ability to be able to get that data from those large manufacturers. So mm. while you did say, you know, there is this new, uh, I think they call it data product. And sometimes when you look at the IoT, uh, you know, hype cycle, mm. they talk about um, the next kind of big thing is going to be the data product, which is going to be selling to the customer products that are really derived out of the data and less of from the actual device. Um, so I think that this is a challenge. I don't have the answer. Um, I think this is where some of the innovation and some of the research here is, is looking at this area. But I think it's important not just to address the business uh, kind of uh, challenges, but also so we can recognize all, all the IoT uh, potential well, that's there. I see Mark, so Mark I don't, champing so at the sorry. bit here. So. Yeah. so I don't disagree with anything you've said. And I don't disagree that there are extraordinary benefits from IoT and technology generally. My house is wired to the hilt, right? We, I have everything. I have more devices than I could possibly count. And the goal here is to right, maximize benefits yeah. and minimize harm. The problem is, and none of my colleagues or co-panelists who are in the government can say this, and for the first time in a long time, I'm not. <laughs> the fact is, we do not have a policy, legal, or regulatory framework in this country that produces incentives to get there. We do not have a framework that induces companies to get to a place where we're maximizing benefits and minimizing harm. We have a framework that maximizes profits and shareholder value over other interests. And so the fact is, to get to a solution, and I'll welcome a debate with anyone, we are 20 years overdue for a comprehensive privacy law in this country. We're the only democracy that doesn't have one. And until we are able to address these issues in a reasonable way through legislation regulation that will support technology, we're going to have a long-term problem. So, Ed, I want to jump in here uh, because <laughs> I'm not going to disagree with Mark's basic point. I think we do need to have a fundamental law and framework for dealing with privacy in the policy and law world. The challenge here is that we had a model for this um, in sort of the early days of the computer revolution which kind of sort of worked. We've lost that model over time. It no longer applies, and we don't have a new model to replace it with. Mm -hmm. Let me explain what I mean by that. Sort of the early model was based on this notion, essentially the model that you would fill out a form and send it in to someone, and that that information would go into a database, 
and that the computer system was a giant filing cabinet with all of this information, and the risk was that this information would live longer than you expect and be used for other purposes. Um, and so that said that there's a focus on disclosure of data um, as opposed to how it's going to be used later. There's a model of notice and consent, which is not so difficult to apply when someone is filling out and submitting a form, but doesn't really work so well anymore when they're implanting a, when they're putting a medical monitor on their wrist or there's a camera in the corner. Notice and consent is very difficult. It's difficult to even imagine how you would implement it for something like, say, ubiquitous cameras that exist in the world. So that model doesn't work so well anymore. And there's a focus as well in that model on the sharing of data as being the sort of relevant boundary crossing event. Whereas nowadays, much more of what happens is we think much more in terms of querying of data or um, people being able to make use of the existence of data without actually acquiring the full data set. So much of what blew up that mental model was changes in technology, but also research has helped us understand how that model was starting to break down. Now the big challenge is what are we going to replace it with? And here again, I think research is starting to point the way, but, I, but we're not really to the point where we have a new model that works in a new way that can answer all the questions that the old model answered in that old world. And to me, that's one of the big challenges, and it ought to be one of the North Stars for research in this area. Try to understand how we can cope with this issue, what kinds of controls and user experience we can do, and how can we make uh, advanced technology our friend in dealing with this, uh, these challenges instead of, making it, uh, instead of making it out as an enemy. Okay, so Ed, let me pull that thread a little more and ask you to expand on something and then we'll I'll lob the next question to Sunu. So the issue is a regulatory environment or, or at least as Mark calls for a, a robust policy in place for protection of data. Is there, a, is there the potential for a technological solution? And if so, what might that look like? Uh, how can we provide people with tools, technological tools, that can be used to help improve the situation? It's early days in, in understanding all of this, I think. Mm -hmm. but, um, but I think we have some idea of how this might play out and how we can, how we can build a new technical reality that better serves uh, these, um, the interests of all of us as, as we deal with these privacy issues. Part of the picture, I think, is in, uh, uh, is in understanding and, more importantly, better applying what's known about statistical information control, right? So this idea of people making inferences about us based on collected information, based on queries to information, how does that all work? We're starting now to build a theory of how we can allow people to interact with data in a way that is privacy preserving. Okay. Um, and I think that is a really important piece of it, right? How can we do this? How can, because that helps us get closer to, that, uh, to, to this goal of understanding how we can capture the positive um, aspects of information collection and the use of information while controlling the negative aspects. Mm -hmm. How can we be selective? Not just how do we give all the information to that person over there, but what kind of interface or interactive protocol can we create mm -hmm. to allow them to get the positive benefits while controlling the negative effects, or at least to let them do what they want to do while being able to rigorously control the, the negative impacts. There's a lot of really exciting research that is, uh, that's coming out around these sort of privacy preserving um, information processing technologies. Um, mm -hmm. And I think there's a huge space there, not only for research to make life better, but also for research to show the way to policymakers about um, what a better world would look like. Fantastic, so this, I, no. I'm thrilled with your comment because it's the perfect setup for Sunu, right? So. Following on, on Ed's uh, answer with respect to, to technology, uh, you've specifically been looking at the role of, of cryptographic protocols or, or cryptography as a potential um, 
tool to help in this, in this solution. And your background combines perfectly the sort of deep technical expertise with the policy apparatus and the policy understanding that you have. So can you talk to us a little bit about the role of cryptography? Uh, I, I had originally decided I would ask you, you know, is cryptography the magic bullet that's going to make it all uh, work? Um, and, I, and I knew your answer would be no, so there's no point in asking it that way. Uh, but, but give us a little uh, glimpse into the work that you're doing in, in using cryptography to help address some of these issues. Right, yeah. Um, so cryptography can definitely help uh, without being a magic bullet. And um, I guess uh, you know, we've heard a lot about what privacy risk is and that it relates to adverse consequences of processing data. It relates to what kinds of information flows we consider appropriate in what context, and the potential risks of those information flows and uses um, it, within, within that framework. And so cryptography provides a toolkit to build systems that have new configurations of information flows. Um, and that includes uh, basically more fine-grained control over uh, access and partial access to data and um, keeping data secret or partially secret even from entities that process it and so on. So for example, uh, I, you and I might message each other on WhatsApp, which is an end-to-end -end encrypted messaging platform, and then our messages would pass through the WhatsApp server, but WhatsApp wouldn't be able to read the message content because of the way the encryption was used. Or using a different cryptographic technique called zero-knowledge proofs, I might be able to prove to somebody that I have an ID that says I'm over 21 without revealing to them my exact age and my address and my birth date and whatever else might actually be on the physical ID that I would show them. And so cryptography provides a sort of larger solution space um, that we can uh, use to, to build pri privacy preserving te technologies. But um, like any toolkit, it uh, doesn't answer the question of, what sorts of uh, things that we should build using these tools. Mm -hmm. And so um, it doesn't answer what sort of information sharing and use we consider appropriate or desirable or too risky in what context. And um, importantly, sort of, uh, what sort of benefits and risks are entailed by each kind of use and for whom and whether we think that's okay. So, that's really a question that we have to work out as a society and as a matter of policy. And cryptography is just one tool that we can use to inform that discussion. Um, and yeah, I guess as it, re it relates to IoT specifically, there's a lot of um, cryptographic techniques that um, already exist that could help. And there's also ongoing research in sort of adapting cryptography uh, to, to particularly suit the needs of uh, IoT applications, including, for example, um, like Kat was referring to uh, specific uh, considerations about aggregation of data. How can we use, uh, get some of the benefits of aggregating data without um, all of the harms, of, uh, harms that it may entail? Mm -hmm. um, and also, many IoT devices are very lightweight, as uh, was also mentioned, and so adapting cryptographic tech techniques to be compatible and uh, very efficient on these types of de devices and other, is another important area of research. Um, so, so that's all to say cryptography can be helpful and it's important that we're careful not to treat it as a magic bullet. Mm. Um, because I guess, because um, using cryptography doesn't necessarily mean that a thing is more privacy protective. You could use encryption to transmit sensitive information to someone who shouldn't have it, and there the <laughs> cryptography is really not helping with the right. privacy problem. So we need to pay attention that um, the way that we use the cryptography is really addressing specific privacy needs in the context we deploy them. Excellent. Thanks very much. Ed or Mark? Or oh, okay, Ed. I'm going to bounce off. So everything, you know, Ed and I are on the same page about like notice and choice. I mean, <laughs> like, forget it. Um, so, but, but you, you raised and you asked about technology. So I've got, you know, a question. I have this really weird fantasy that science and evidence might actually inform our laws. It'd be really cool. And so if you look at a lot of the privacy laws in the states that are popping up, there's a particular issue that particularly concerns me, which is um, definitions that are getting codified into these laws. This category of data that 
our le state legislatures are calling de-identify data is just carved out of privacy law. So if it's not identified or I personally identifiable, if it's not your name, your social security number, or your phone number, we're not going to cover it by this privacy law. So everything de-identified is like, oh, so we're getting these laws, but it's, it's not even covered. Just, yeah. What so, do we, can we, we need to address that. What does it mean that it's de-identified? And if it's, my name isn't there, doesn't mean a decision about me can't be made that could harm me. I think this connects, this question connects in an interesting way also to what Sanu was talking about, which is that policymakers' intuitions about how these things work or what's possible and not possible with technology are, you know, unsurprisingly, like most people's who, without mm -hmm. a lot of training mm -hmm. and study, um, often not very accurate. So this Wrong, idea yeah. of de-identified data seems to make intuitive sense, but from a purely scientific standpoint, it doesn't really stand up. You need to think about the question of what can be inferred from data in a different way. Mm -hmm. um, and the same is true, I think, with respect to uses of cryptography, mm -hmm. right? Um, that some, in, in some respects, cryptography is much more powerful than an untrained intuition might suggest. Something like a zero-knowledge proof would seem intuitively to be impossible, but it's well established in cryptography that that's possible. But then there's some other things that you might intuitively expect to be possible with cryptography that turn out not to be. So this mismatch between the intuition that many people, including policymakers, have about what's possible and what technology can and can't do versus what the reality is, is, in my mind, one of the big challenges. And I don't know. I'm curious, Sunu, if you have thoughts about how we might improve that? Yeah, so, um, you know, I, I am also on the same page about um, de-identification and notice and consent and all that. I think de-identification is, is an interesting example where we've seen a dialogue developing, um, sort of starting in the technical community about how these methods are ineffective and what sorts of um, sensitive information can be recovered from de-identified de data. Um, and that information, that, that sort of uh, research and dialogue sort of drifting over into the law and policy space um, and current legal approaches are inadequate and still largely based on de-identification, but there seems to be a growing recognition of the need to approach um, even the legal definitions differently because of demonstrated technical research. Um, so so um, I'm curious to see what happens next. And, um, I agree with uh, Mark as well that uh, the a, a focus on the sort of consequences of processing this data rather than um, identifiability or something something that is not as tied to the sort of harm that we're trying I just, to. Just want to address a verb you used, which is drifting into policy. So I've been in DC a long time. These laws, just so we all know, were written by six or seven really big companies on the West Coast. So it's not like an, there's no accident to it, right? It was sort of like word for word and given to a certain state legislator to pass and, and codify into these laws a framework that is really, it's outdated before it's gone into law. Um, and now it's going to sort of populate around the country and not produce, the, you know, it's not true that doing nothing is, you know, doing something is better than nothing. Doing something that doesn't do what you think it does mm -hmm. can actually be a worse outcome. Yeah, I think I think I meant more sort of drifting into the law and policy dialogue rather than drifting into the law itself. <laughs> <laughs> so, so you've you've eliminated one of the questions I have on here, which is why can't we just de-identify everything and eliminate the privacy risk altogether? So I I'm going to skip that question because yeah. uh, because uh, it's appropriately naive and and I've already been disabused of that notion. So so thank you. Um, I'll ask another provocative question uh, this time to all of you. Anybody uh, would like to chime in, uh, which is, why should I care that my IoT devices are are grabbing everything about me? I don't have anything to hide. It's not a big deal. Why? Why should I? Why should I pay attention to this debate? Why does it matter? Well, you do probably have something to hide. I think we all <laughs> do have some things that we would not rather not be public. I'd, I'd prefer, by the way, that no one go looking for anything that I might be willing to hide. 
thank you. There's nothing wrong with having something to hide, right? right? right. That's why we're all fully That's, clothed. Yeah. <laughs> um, the, um, <laughs> so the other thing I would say about this, you know, all jokes aside, um, these information that exists about us that might be used, uh, it reduces our freedom of action in mm -hmm. the future. Um, it reduces the opportunities available to us. It may allow people to infer things about us that we as a society believe people should not be finding out about each other. Um, and um, it's, it's a loss of control over your own fate and over your own set of choices, fundamentally, that can happen when people out there build a very comprehensive um, model of who you are and what you're likely to do. And you know, sometimes we're afraid that those models will be wrong mm -hmm. and will be harmed. Sometimes we're afraid that those models will be correct and will be harmed as a result. Mm -hmm. But either way, um, we'd, as individuals, we'd like to have more control. And as a society, we'd like to have policies about what information about people goes where. And it also will. Depend, it, it also will impact different groups differently, and I think that's a very important yeah. point. And so, um, so for some communities, perhaps at this moment in time, you're less concerned. But for other communities, um, knowing that your entire surfing behavior and what you're reading and where you're researching or where you're praying, where that's being collected or, I don't know, getting an abortion and having an app track you there or having geofencing around abortion clinics for advertisements, I mean... So I'm not in that position right now, but for a lot of communities, um, the stakes are much higher and that's important. And it's not just by, you know, it's about, it could be sexual orientation or gender or race, or it could be um, children or battered women who need to, you know, stay and avoid um, the batterer. I mean, there's a lot of groups within that. And so that's also an important point. We may not all feel it the same way. One of the threads that has come through every single panel is the impact of either the positive or negative aspects of mm. the development of information technologies of the last 30 years having a disproportionate impact, either positive or negative, on certain populations, right? That's, mm. That has come across in every single panel, and it's certainly true here as well. Mm. So, agreed. Um, I want to spend enough time uh, in, in this phase before we open it up to, to questions to talk a little bit about two things. Uh, one is workforce issues and the other is what NIDRD can do. I'm going to start by pulling a thread that Kat started, which is this, this growing concern. And I think in the last panel, they talked about the, the exponential growth of, of certain aspects of technology, in this case, artificial intelligence, and the linear growth of mm -hmm. things to deal with it. Mm -hmm. And the fact that those things are not, that's not sustainable, right? And, and I think workforce is one of those things. We're yep. getting to the stage where, uh, certainly in cybersecurity, we're seeing this, and we have the National Initiative for Cybersecurity Education that's trying to address mm -hmm. some of these uh, workforce challenges in cybersecurity, but you can multiply that in AI and yep. in quantum information science and, and artificial intelligence. I mean, I said artificial intelligence, but I'm uh, in um, uh, uh, privacy, you know. Where are the privacy experts? Where are the cybersecurity experts? We can't scale our way out of this problem by just developing you know, armies and armies of people. So what do we do about this? That was a question from me to answer. <laughs> See, I get to put Kat on the spot because she works in my lab. So. Absolutely. I wasn't sure what the question was. I just um, said Yeah. <laughs> Um, you know, I think I, I, you know, I like to look at some of the work that we do, hopefully at NIST, um, to contribute to that is putting some of those tools out there, yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, putting those frameworks out there. And, and, and while frameworks aren't always Sorry. a playbook. Great answer. Okay. Okay. Good. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Earned this year's bonus. Um, <laughs> Just kidding. Um, uh, but I, I, I do think that the only way that we can actually, uh, because again, we can't train everybody. We can't put armies of everybody out there. But what we can do is we can put the tools out there and try to bring everybody out there kind of up to speed, give them a framework to think about risk, whether it be cybersecurity risk or whether it be privacy risk. Um, and, you know, hopefully that's one way I think... Um, there's, there's obvious work that we can do to actually make 
uh, perhaps some tools available to automate some of these processes. So can, can I poke you on that? Oh, go ahead and poke me. <laughs> you said we can, so, as long as it's not about so, the... Right, so I, I know how you can give an assignment to your engineer and yeah. say, okay, as yeah. you build out this database or this network, I want you to make sure that you, know, you do security by design and I want you to bake in confidentiality, integrity, and availability. Okay. Right. So what do you tell your engineer? Like, I want you to just like bake in privacy into this thing. No. Just, just like here you go. But that's not the as, tool. as you build it, mm -hmm. so what? How do you translate that? What are you going to give to a technologist or an engineer or someone who's coding to ensure that they can protect the subsequent use of data when it's shared? Well, well, I think part of it is we don't only focus on the engineer. I think it's actually uh, you know a top-down uh, corporate governance issue mm. as well. Um, so I think when we're talking about putting the tools out there and, and, and when you look at something like the cybersecurity framework, it's intended to be used both by the corporate governance to kind of understand and inform the organization. This is our appetite for risk. This is what we want to prioritize. This is for our industry where our priorities are in the cybersecurity framework. I would hope that the privacy framework could do something similar. So I think it's more than just tell your software engineer build privacy into this, it does require corporate governance, it requires that permeating and priorities being set, and then the tools being made available, such as you know, low code options, was something that was brought up and said, hey, we cannot train our way out of a workforce, but perhaps we need to look at tools like low code options to actually enable organizations who were building physical things and figure out how they can actually build IoT things. So if we can extrapolate that to um, other desirable attributes that we have around privacy and cybersecurity and make it easier, uh, perhaps we can you know, make better use of the limited resources we have. Yeah. I said I didn't have all the answers. So, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so I think it's nice. really important to think about <clears throat> this as leveraging the, um, the, the talent that we have yeah. and that technology can help to do that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you talk to people who teach in universities, they will say enrollments are growing. Um, there is no scarcity of students in the classroom. Um, and more graduates are coming out with the basic skills in these fields. And yet, if you talk to people who are hiring mm -hmm. in industry, mm -hmm. they will mm -hmm. say they wish there were a lot more people. Yeah. And, um, um, and it's just the mismatch, I think, between the workforce, which is growing at a somewhat healthy rate versus the demand, which is really growing much more quickly. Mm -hmm. um, and if we're gonna meet that gap, it has to be through better tools that allow the same number of skilled technical people to get more work done and to do it at a higher quality and more accurately in the same time. Terrific, so the goal here is to look back at the NIDRD program, and there's been some, some uh, remarkable advances over the last 30 years. I think cybersecurity got the early attention and still gets a lot of attention from the NIDRD agencies. Privacy is now growing in importance. I know, Mark, you've been, uh, you've been sort of a lone wolf in the past trying to get people to pay attention to privacy. I think you, you got your wish. People are beginning to pay much more attention in the agencies. What can we do that we're not currently doing? Uh, do, you, do you have any ideas, All, any of you? Um, respond to that and then we'll open it up for, for questions. I guess I would start by saying to the NIDRD community, keep doing what you're doing. Mm -hmm. okay. um, a lot of these changes and advances that we've talked about up here have been driven mm -hmm. by federal information technology research. Um, and there is, um, and <clears throat> yet, I think the policy community is still uh, awaiting um, further improvements that we're going to need in order to build that sort of new model that I talked about earlier. This is an area, I think, where there's a lot of leverage where research can contribute a lot to better policies and toward uh, improving the, the entire enterprise. Okay. Anyone else before we open it up? And I'll, yeah. I'll, um, I'll say I heard a couple of encouraging things today. This, this idea of like uh, telling stories and getting the mm -hmm. message out I think is incredibly important. Um, you know, we talked about, you know, how can our, our policymakers be more informed when they're making policy in areas that are very complex, even for some moderately technical people like myself to follow. Um, you know, let alone you know people who are actually mean well 
uh, but perhaps don't quite understand the technical area. So figuring out how to actually communicate that in ways to a non-technical uh, audience, and I think stories is a great way. So I was really encouraged to hear that today because I think that is critical. Um, because anecdotally, I can, I can say, uh, when we started down the path of the uh, cybersecurity for IoT program at NIST, um, we focused on both cybersecurity and privacy uh, because at NIST we feel that um, as we were putting out publications and guidance, especially those for federal agencies, um, we said it was really important to give federal agencies guidance on privacy as well. Um, but at some, problem, at some point we kind of realized that um, the kind of guideposts around privacy were not out there necessarily the way they were out there for cybersecurity. Um, the maturity of the frameworks and the tools that were out there for cybersecurity were well beyond where privacy was. And, you know, because we saw that difference, we said, well, for the time being, we are going to focus on the tools related to cybersecurity because we have kind of a solid foundation there. We have a good understanding of the guardrails uh, while we're waiting for maybe some of those guardrails in privacy to kind of help us uh, kind of derive where we should be focused on when it comes to the technology and the tools. You know, one, this is actually just came to my head now. It's more concrete or very specific, but um, the one thing that's missing or so right at the time I left the White House in 2017 because there was an election. Um, <laughs> so um, with our next project, I thought at OMB might have been would be to update guidance on how to actually conduct a privacy impact assessment. And NIST has done work on this in the privacy framework, which says you should do a privacy impact assessment. And here's generally some criteria. What could be done is actually um, not more guidance, but more guidance with really specific, concrete, complicated examples of how you mm -hmm. take this concept of a privacy impact assessment and apply it to these Internet of Things devices or this network or you know, this technology and show right, how it can be done at the different points. Right Within each point of the life cycle of data, you can make choices. Um, how will that affect privacy if you go left versus right mm -hmm. or if you encrypt or not? Like, mm -hmm. That, and that is not a small undertaking, but if there's research with people that bandwidth because it's difficult, that would help others um, as they set out on doing that and not just cut and paste some existing things. Good, good. And Thank throughout this much. panel, I feel like we've been sort of changing between talking about the skill sets that um, people with technical backgrounds have to address these problems and how technology can help and then how the skill sets that the different skill sets that uh, law and policy people can bring um, and where they meet but it, it also seems sort of instead of going between one one and then the other really important to support research that is across both because the problem is inherently socio-technical um, so it might be good to maybe support people who get their, let's say, their JDs and their PhDs in computer science. Right? That, for example. What, for example. <laughs> like, what do you mean by socio-tech? Like, can you just spin that out, socio-technical? So I think um, it sort of relates to what uh, the discussion about, uh, for example, the appealing idea of having a technical solution that enforces privacy norms. And uh, I feel like in, in, that's very context-dependent context right. and um, society-dependent. And it will be a thing that needs to adapt and probably not consist only of a technical right. uh, mm. expertise. And so um, sort of co-developing uh, solutions to that and also in improving the, even at the sort of uh, during the educational um, curriculum, uh, both the the policy um, the po policy side's knowledge of the technical uh, details necessary for this uh, problem and the the technical um, education uh, coverage of social and policy issues I think would be important. So when are you going to run for Senate? <laughs> 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 Terrific. So we have about five and a half minutes left. Uh, I'd like to invite people to come uh, provide their questions to the panel, uh, okay. challenge Here them. They come. Very good. So start over here. Does this work? Yes. Could you introduce yourself and where you're okay. from? My name is Patty Ordonez. I'm from the University of Puerto Rico uh, in San Juan. Mm -hmm. And in minority, marginalized communities, a lot of talk is being done about data governance um, and who owns the data. And you guys talk a lot about trust. 
and the necessity for trust in AI. And so it, within our communities, a lot of times what we're looking at and thinking like, why can't we use our data as a commodity? Like why don't we have, because we'll trust the, the solution more if we can see the, the, the data that's collected about us, right? Mm -hmm. And so what about, what do you think about the idea of data governance? That, uh, have, like it, it's a very, very popular thing among Native Americans and um, other. So this is being, being more open and transparent about the data that you have on individuals so that and they have yes. some. And so, that the, so it's not like this, this form that you, that's a whole bunch of legalese that mm. nobody, mm. that a commoner cannot understand, right. but that they can go in and see who has what of their data. And therefore, they trust the applications more. Because I, I, and I say this also because after Hurricane Maria, there were so many apps going up. Nobody wanted to publish in them because they didn't know where, who was going to have that data. Yeah. And so people wanted to put up sources of water. They wanted to put up where yeah. there's electricity. Nobody did mm. for fear. Yeah. And even though AI has a big, you know, mm. and they, there's, everybody's talking about the need for data from these uh, to make it less biased. So why not so this think of it as... The issue is, is yeah. pivotal here. Right. So any, any comments? I, I think, think that's a, yeah. go, go I think this is a huge issue. Um, you know, to get beyond the kind of theater of notice and consent that we is often the reality that um, that uh, many people, including um, many communities, have to deal with. And um, how can we get to a place where people not only are told what is happening, but actually play a role in deciding what should happen? I think institutions can play a really important role here. Having the right institution which can speak up on behalf of a community makes a big difference. And, um, and having, but how to make sure that there's a real voice in what's done is obviously not, primarily not a technical problem. Mm -hmm. And the access question, which, oh sorry. Of course. Yeah. The access question, when people make it sound rather simple about why can't I see my data? Well, the question is what data and what category of data because we have data that you provide to a company, yeah. like when I register for Facebook, but then Facebook has data that other people provided to them about me. More importantly, then they've got my profile and the inferences and inferences from inferences and observe data. So is that also data that I get access to or not? And how do I know if they have it? Mm -hmm. And actually they don't want to give that, but that's actually the data that I'm most interested in. Mm -hmm. And so that question about access becomes much more complicated because it's not the world of 20 years ago where the data is simply the form I filled out online. It's all those preferences and all the inferences. And I'm not sure how we manage access. So you have to look holistically, right, at the entire yeah. data environment. Yeah. yeah, and as you look at IoT, yeah. again, it's yeah, exponential now because it's passive collection of my data too. Think about the, the do you want to call them the good old days when there was even the consideration that you could opt out of anything. There's no opting out anymore, right? Everything's ubiquitous. There's no, no you, if you're a Luddite, you can't possibly disconnect. <laughs> anyway, um, so thank you very much. Next question, please. Hi, I'll try to make fast. Uh, yeah, Ben Zorn from Microsoft. Thank you, very interesting panel. Um, I, my question is kind of the intersection between AI, the last panel, and this panel, which is that these models now are very large, billions of parameters, probably a trillion now. Um, and they store a lot of data. I mean, they're trained on data, et cetera. So uh, how does, how does our understanding of what data are in these models and whether or not private information is being leaked through them, uh, how is that developing and, and what can we do about it? Oh. Just, I'll just make a quick uh, uh, <laughs> reference to, uh, you know, in the, in the GDPR in, in Europe, this, this right to be forgotten, how do you implement that? There's, there was actually a really interesting article I read a year ago, I think, about the destruction of algorithms. If you have algorithms that were built on data that you're not really allowed to have and, and you're told, okay, you have to destroy those data, you actually have to go back and destroy those algorithms too because they, they are models of the data they ingested. And so the right to be forgotten, you, you have an echo in the algorithm, you have to get rid of that as well. So yeah. it's, a, it's a big challenge. So in general, right, if data was given to the training process that trains a model, and if you didn't do something rigorous to prevent that uh, data or downstream information from it from being encoded in the model or emitted by the model, it probably was encoded and emitted, mm -hmm. right? One of the things we've learned over time that's come out of research is that unless you use a rigorous method to stop information from flowing, it will probably flow, mm -hmm. right? And that's why there's been so much emphasis on building 
rigorous and provable models of these things, and then the technologies for things like privacy preserving machine learning. Mm -hmm. It's early days again in those spaces, but I think one of the big lessons is if you don't do something that's grounded in solid research and knowledge, then you're not going to succeed at controlling uh, oh. that. Apologies, we have negative 15 seconds left. <laughs> thank you. So thank you very much. Uh, so we, we won't be able to take another question, but I do want to abuse the time long enough for each of my panel members here to give sort of a 15 second observation, closing statement. You want to start, Ed? Sure, uh, two things. Uh, first of all, as I think I've said various times, it's early days in this area, and there's a lot we still don't know and a lot of knowledge that's going to develop. That's number one, and number two, to Chuck and Cami and many other people who have been involved in NIDR, you should be very proud. <laughs> thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, I think I'll just uh, say thank you very much. This was such an informative day, and it was uh, fantastic. I'm glad I came early and listened to all the panels because there was something that resonated in every single panel uh, that I that I listened to today. And uh, I'm also, and, and in all honesty, I'm so glad that ITL's mission is around trust uh, because I think so much of these discussions that we're having um, all really go back to trust. Well, how can I have trust in the technology? Because if I don't trust it, I'm not going to use it. And that's, uh, to me, irrespective of whether I'm an individual. But, um, you know, in IoT, we also look at the industrial applications of IoT. And there are lots of benefits to be reaped there. And I can tell you, healthcare organizations are not going to adopt the technology if they can't trust it. And smart factories are not going to adopt the technology if they can't trust where their data is going and who's using their data. They have proprietary concerns. So the trust question um, and how do you reflect trust, I think, is going to be one of the, uh, one of the big things we, can, we should tackle uh, and then figure out how to build that into what we do. Terrific. Sonu? Yeah, I think uh, if I have to pick a point from our discussion, um, I'd elaborate a bit on uh, Ed's point about um, intuitions failing us sometimes about uh, the kinds of privacy harms and information flows that can occur. I think as we, as we saw in the last question about um, machine learning systems as well as um, in all of the discussion about sort of increasingly complex and ubiquitous devices, um, there will be I think we can rely less and less on our intuition and um, have to be preemptive uh, in, in putting in precautions. Um, so yeah, I'm grateful for the discussion. Terrific. And Mark, you got the first word, you get the last word. Awesome. So I'm going to do, make fun of my co-panelists, mostly. <laughs> first, um, I've worked with Ed for a very long time, and Ed makes a point that for me is very helpful repeatedly, which is that we are still in the early stages of all of this, and that um, there are and will be solutions, but they're not going to just happen. And so we're going to need leaders and leadership to make it happen. But it is new, and that allows for optimism. Two, we, we, beforehand, yeah, we were talking about um, our teenagers, and you mentioned trust. Mm -hmm. And we were saying that our teenage kids do not trust technology any longer and don't trust the big companies any longer. And that's a big change from, say, millennials. The trust is down. And third, um, when you want to run and be in Congress, I'm there. <laughs> because that, we need that expertise um, to link that tech and law. Fantastic. With that, thank you to all the panelists thank and you. thank you for your attention. Thanks. Well done. <laughs>